this is a lightning talk. Uh, Kenneth? Yeah, there you are, I see you. We met yesterday. Um, so Kenneth Finnegan will be here, or is here, to uh, talk about um, serving security updates to every Linux server in the world. This could be longer than 10 minutes, Kenneth, but that's all you have. Yeah, I'm gonna have to be quick. All right, thank you very much. So welcome, Kenneth. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, let's see. All right, great. All right, and then there we go. All right, so my name is Kenneth Finnegan. Um, I, my day job is I work at Arista Networks and Support, but probably more of you know me as one of the benevolent dictators for the Fremont Cabal Internet Exchange. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to you today about Linux mirrors. So just to double click for one second on what a Linux distro means and what we mean when we say a mirror, um, Every Linux distribution is starting with the same repository of source code, right? Everyone starts with the same Linux kernel source code. Everyone starts with the same LibreOffice code. Everyone starts with the same GNOME repos. And the difference between every separate Linux distribution is that they decide how they're going to compile, how they're going to build each of these software packages together, how they're going to package them, and then how they're going to ship them to their users and what policies and procedures and what is kind of umbrella termed release engineering that they then you know, ship it. And that's what makes Arch Linux different from CentOS, right? And so when, someone, when any application developer picks one Linux distribution, they're really more interested than anything else in specifically what does this distribution do differently from a re release engineering perspective relative to any other Linux distribution that's building off the same code, right? So that's that's what we talk about when we're talking about a Linux distribution. So the Linux distribution is responsible to somehow either through donations or fundraising or a support model or some, you know, someone with a big checkbook, they set up their build farm to compile all of their packages, they sign them, they master these disk images, container images and packages and then that's what everyone downloads. Um, for incredibly small projects, they may just have one what, was, what would be called a tier zero server that everyone would download the files from. Unfortunately, um, downloading all the files from a single server doesn't work very well. And so given that Linux distributions don't have a budget for a CDN, given that they're free, and so no one's paying them to build these large content distribution networks to ship updates, those the responsibility of hosting all of their produced artifacts and serving them to the thousands or millions of users falls on groups of volunteers, right? And so they, the, the project themselves produce one golden copy of all of their artifacts. Um, dozens or hundreds of volunteer servers would, on a regular basis every few hours, copy, do a differential copy to update themselves to what the latest golden image is, and then ultimately the thousands or millions of package manager clients would query them um, for is there a newer version of the software I have installed that I should install instead. And so what we're talking about here is the community mirrors, which are how the Linux distributions scale horizontally to be able to serve their sometimes incredibly large install bases. So who runs these mirrors? Um, traditionally and canonically, it was primarily academic institutions, right? Universities, someone in the CS department would feel strongly about their BSD of choice or Linux, and they would put together some hardware, um, and they would set up a mirror, and, or, and then they would be one of the kind of pillars of supporting the Linux distributions for all the users. The second group of people that would do it would be Linux user groups. Right, and so these are the clubs of people that use the Linux distribution that feel strongly about it, and so they would set up a server to host either their one Linux distribution of choice, or more often than not, several, you know, six, 12, 20 different distributions on the one server. And then the third category, and DigitalOcean actually is a great example of this, generous ISPs that have a spare engineering resources would, out of the goodness of their heart, set up these servers and host updates. Um, DigitalOcean is, I think one of the most notable ones for they point all of their internal droplets at internal mirrors that they run themselves, which is why if you ever run apt update on a, on a digital ocean droplet, it's so much faster than it is anywhere else. 
the issue and kind of what I want to bring to everyone's attention here is that these pillars of the load-bearing Linux district mirror infrastructure, these universities, are kind of very quietly and subtly on the decline. Um, go, go, to, go find any uh, network engineer here that is working at a university and ask them about their five or two year plan to move out of all of their data center space on campus. Um, is unfortunately a whole lot of the universities are getting pressure from up high from management to vacate their data center space and move as much as they can up into the cloud and these want weird boxes that are one third of their egress traffic um, that, you know, the guy that set it up has either retired or died, um, tends to just get the cord yanked, and that's the end of that university being in the mirror system. And so, back at the beginning of the year, uh, one of my cohorts in the cabal, um, Wardy9 on Twitter, uh, John Hawley in real life, um, we were discussing, man, like, you know, we, we need more projects in our life. We're, we don't have too many balls up in the air. And so we went and spent several thousand dollars building a 2RU box with 96 terabytes of hard drives in it to start hosting as much Linux as we could. Um, they, for us, the funding model was I posted about it on Twitter um, and entertained our, my followers with the shenanigans we got into. Um, and then we started serving about 10 to 15 terabytes a day of traffic off of this one box. And then we started graphing it. Um, because, I mean, what, what is a whole bunch of traffic without a bunch of pretty graphs analyzing that traffic? And so we built a whole influx in Grafana pipeline, and then we were able to pivot all of our, this traffic and requests by which project was it, what ASs were requesting it, and kind of one of the first things that jumped out at us is, huh, a whole bunch of the traffic is coming from some of the smallest folders. Right, because when you're a mirror, you need to carry all of that project's artifacts locally. Um, is the kind of thin front end caching doesn't work very well with Linux distribution repos. And so the fact that Ubuntu, their ISOs, the, just, their, just their ISOs is about a 25 gigabyte folder. And over the span of a week, we serve 14 terabytes of just those 25 gigabytes worth of files. Um, made us realize that while we spent about $4,000 on this big 2RU that took a lot of planning and has a ton of hard drives and a ton of RAM in it, we realized that if you pick the right projects, you can make a proportionally larger impact with fewer resources dedicated to it. Um, as we realized that if we cut the cost to about 10%, right, right, and so if we only spend two or three or $400 on a server, we can serve something like 30 to 60% of the impact of one of these larger mirrors. So the micro mirror project was born. And so um, this was us realizing that while we can take one big server and place it in Fremont, California, and we can be you know, a nominally large impact on Linux distributions, if we instead take a $25 thin client off of eBay, because we don't care if it fails, because there's 200 of these servers online, uh, we buy a two terabyte used SSD on eBay because we don't care if it fails because there's 200 of these servers. Um, and we find someone somewhere who's willing to plug this thing in for us. Um, we can sit there and serve about one third of the traffic as our $4,000 server for 10% of the cost. And so we started deploying these things. Um, and then as we started digging into it more, we kind of realized, wow, like, this is something that, like, we're gonna, like, the fact that I'm able to deploy these and start actually kind of a notably positive impact on Linux distribution infrastructure right now is a little bit scary because it means that there was a lot of low-hanging fruit to be made there. And so what I wanted to kind of talk about in this lightning talk is that um, the, the, the traditional institutions, the universities that were hosting all of these main, what we, what we call tier one mirrors, which are the bigger ones that were more reliable that other mirrors fed off of, they're going away, right? And so our personal project that you know, the two of us are working on is we're looking for sites to put micro mirrors, we're you know, looking for funding, but 
we're just two people and that's not really what matters here. Um, what I wanna talk to all of you guys about and get everyone else in this conference thinking about is how can you be hosting a mirror yourself, right? Because I think that if, you know, the, the problem with these mirrors is that for a normal developer, someone that runs Linux at home or someone that runs Linux in virtual machines, the idea of serving 15 terabytes a day from a single server is terrifying. That is a huge number, right? For those normal citizens, that sounds really hard. In this room, any of us would look at 15 terabytes a day, and I think the technical term for that is a rounding error. And so any, if any network operators here have lots of surplus bandwidth, it's something to think about that could you host somewhere in your network a Linux mirror to contribute back to kind of the open source projects and the community that has kind of made like not only networking but like the whole internet and you know all of the things that we move across the network so so much more possible right and the ways that you do it i think there's there's value in diversity there right and so whether it's go find a local linux user group and say hey if you guys organize a server that we can drop into 2ru in our data center somewhere and you let the lug manage it and then you guys provide the space and power and transit that's a model if you're looking to get some of your junior engineers sysops or DevOps experience about how do we deploy and manage a Linux server in a network environment, this is an incredibly good way to do it. And you start learning all these lessons about, huh, what happens when I start having to actually serve thousands of requests at once from one box, right? And it's valuable lessons that fold back into all of these automation and coding and um, kind of all of these extra things that we talk about and we want network engineers to stop being iOS CLI monkeys, um, this is an excellent venue for us to start, you know, kind of it's, it's a low priority scavenger class project that you can start contributing and making substantial impact, positive impact back on the rest of the community. Um, so the, the, the map on the right there is um, actually where we have deployed the 11 micro mirrors so far. Um, at this point, um, if you're interested in hosting one of them, talk to me, but more likely than not, what I really want you to do is think about could you take some hardware you have already and spin one up independent of us because the more diversity there is in this realm of these mirrors and the more different approaches and different organizations involved, the less linchpin we get as far as when one of the major universities suddenly announces, oh, we're done, we're out of the mirror department and all of a sudden it's like a quarter of the mirrors in the North America start having technical problems because their upstream sources disappeared. Um, so that's, that's pretty much what I've got here. Um, if you have any questions up here, I would love to hear them right now. All right, I guess not. Um, I, I will be outside as well, and so if you have any offline questions or want to talk to me privately, um, by all means, feel free. Thank you.